So today I'm back in the garage and here's the radio cabinet for our Cossa radio. And as you can probably see, it's in pretty poor condition. Um, normally I try to keep things as original as possible. I don't like to refinish cabinets because I think it's nice when a radio shows its, uh, its age. And I think, you know, the patina and the in-ground dirt and the odd scratch and knock, well, that's all part of the game. But it reaches a point where the cabinet kind of just goes too far. It wouldn't really be possible to touch this up or make it look good. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to strip off the old finish and uh, I'm going to refinish it. So this is the hole here where the speaker sits inside and you can see that we've got this lovely detail on it which is kind of like tiger stripes that will go all the way around. Now I've got to admit it would be absolutely lovely to have kept that detail but the cabinet's just too bashed up and uh, although it might be possible to actually cabinet scrape around here and uh, you know mechanically remove the varnish uh, then perhaps go and refinish it I'm, I'm just not willing to put that amount of effort in that's the honest answer I mean it is also bashed up some of the finish has actually uh, come off anyway uh, there's bits of veneer missing I'm not going to do one of these jobs where you repair every piece of veneer and inlay it and make it look like new my basic idea is just to uh, to cover up the worst of the scuffs and the, the scrapes to try to make it look in a tolerable uh, condition where perhaps my wife will allow me to bring this thing into the house because she, uh, she certainly won't let me bring it in as it stands at the moment. So what I propose to do is I'm just going to use a I'm going to use a chemical stripper, you know, something like nitromose they would call it in the UK. Um, normally this varnish comes off quite easily because it's thin going to remove the finish, uh, rub it down with uh, wire wool, let it all dry then I'm going to restain it, probably a similar colour to what it is now and uh, then just a couple of coats of something like Danish oil. So that is today's um, horrible job it's, uh, and it is a horrible job as well. I hate doing any kind of uh, woodwork and especially refinishing cabinets. I mean it's uh, it's like a night out with a girl from Barnsley. It's you know horrible and smelly and you're definitely going to be a double gloving by the end of the evening. So you've got to remember back in the day radios were probably somewhat of an economy item I mean certainly would have been very expensive but this wasn't a Rolls-Royce radio this was uh, I'm not going to say it was made for the common man because the common man it wouldn't have afforded this but certainly the cabinets were built down to a price you tend to find that the materials are quite poor the veneers and the glues that they use and uh, you do have, often have problems when you're stripping these because the uh, the veneer can lift off the plywood very very easily uh, and that may or may not occur here. Maybe that's another good reason for a uh, cabinet scraping rather than using a, a chemical stripper. Uh, I'm just looking at this and I'm wondering if that could be a replacement glass. Hmm, looks as though it doesn't quite fit. It looks as though it's been cut a bit crudely. I don't know, maybe. I'll just go ahead and collect up these fixings before they get lost. Because I lose everything I'm afraid. But on the plus side, I always have lots of parts left over at the end of these restorations, so uh, probably one day I'll be able to build a radio out of all the parts I've had left over. Oh, that had a piece of paper jammed under it, so I'm wondering if that one uh, has been doxxed in the past. Could have done. Oh, oh buggeration. Just dropped all my screws all over the back of the workbench. So you can probably see I've got this plastic uh, plastic dust sheet material, paint, anti-splatter sheet, whatever you want to call it. I've got that all over my bench because I am going to be using a, a chemical stripper and uh, while I'm not that precious about the workbench, if you actually put paper, put this plastic down everything, when we're finished with the job it makes tidying up easy. We may as well go ahead and remove these uh, screws that would normally hold the back cover on as well. And there's still quite a lot of dirt and dust and detritus. I'm going to get this out of the cabinet now because if I don't do it now what we'll probably find will happen is when we actually do come to put the final finish on it this dust will get everywhere so let me just go ahead and brush and scrape it out, vacuum it out. No, I think that's got most of the dirt and detritus out. Now it actually looks as though the inside of this radio may have actually been painted uh, a brown colour. It's certainly not finished in varnish but I think it could have a 
I don't know, just some brown paint or spray on it. So I'm going to go and find some paint stripper now. I'm just going to leave you to admire these lovely tiger stripes because they won't be there much longer. And just for the record today I'm going to be wearing these horrible yellow vinyl gloves. I just make the point of uh, saying that I'm using vinyl gloves because vinyl gloves are just a little bit more resistant than uh, the typical latent latex gloves that you might have. You find if you use latex gloves a lot of chemicals will quite easily uh, eat through them but this vinyl material it is better but it still might dissolve our way through here so uh, yeah, important to protect yourself from chemicals. Uh, I never used to care when I was younger, but I find that my skin is more sensitive to these chemicals as I get older, so uh, I'm gloving. The, these things are an awful colour, aren't they? It just makes me feel ill. Quite a hot day here today, and one of the problems with using some of this stuff is that it can dry a little bit too quickly. And uh, that may or may not be a problem today. Well, it certainly smells like I uh, remember the old nitromoles used to smell like, but it does seem a bit thinner. Now, in my experience, this uh, varnish is only quite thinly applied, and it will come off pretty easily. As usual, doing things in the wrong order. I started at the uh, front, whereas you should start at the back. That way you're not dragging your wrists over the chemicals and stuff like that. I am just hoping that it isn't going to uh, start lifting the veneer off because that always is a potential problem using these chemical strippers. And uh, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. And uh, as I said, our tiger stripes are unfortunately dissolving away. Very sad. Now when I've done these radios in the past I've actually found that this old finish generally comes off pretty easily. It's only very thinly applied and uh, after so many years it almost just falls off and uh, this stuff just seemed to be coming off okay I think. Probably take a couple of applications of the stuff though. I can feel that the varnish is a bit heavier down here. So that's kind of normal. Some of this stuff comes off very, very easily, and some of it's a little bit more stubborn. Yep, that's thickening up quite a bit that, the kind of stripper's drying, so we need to uh, wet that off again. Okay, well that was a first pass and I can still see we've got quite a lot of uh, varnish still remaining here that I've missed. So what I'm going to do is, uh, well we're going to give it another coat I think. Let's just scrape this off. We've missed quite a lot under here as well haven't I?
Okay, so that was a that was a coat against the grain. Now we're going to go with the grain. I think I've said to you earlier, haven't I? Probably numerous times. I'm absolutely rubbish at woodwork. It just isn't really my thing. Never seem to get good results. Now just the very top surface to do. Well, I think we're going to call that done.
that's just think it would have been just as easy to bite this finish on with uh, a rag rather than brushing it on. But the general idea is you just put a load on to start with and then what we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll wipe it off. The other thing is it's so warm in here I think we might not have a lot of working time on it. In fact I've got a feeling that might very much be the case. Probably a little bit too warm today to be doing this kind of job. The thing about using Danish oil though is, to be honest, you can't really get it wrong. I did thin this uh, Danish oil down a little bit with some uh, turpentine substitutes, kind of white spirits, uh, kind of anything will do. I'm still beating myself up that we've lost the, uh, the zebra stripe motif somewhere around the front of the, uh, the radio speaker. I think that's a real shame. I'm not happy about myself for that, but um, I don't know. This speaker was sorry. This radio was really beaten up. I'm sure you'll agree. And uh, reaches a point where you know what what really can you do apart from strip it back and uh, have a go. I actually don't think the underlying wood was in too bad a condition. It was uh, actually pretty good. And is, that, is that tacking off? So I've got a bit more working time with that, I think. So the basic technique that I'm employing here, like I say, it's not rocket science. I'm, I'm just putting a load on. We'll leave it five minutes to soak in, or maybe less in this temperature because it's really warm in here. Uh, and then what we do is we just wipe it off. The only problem about using Danish oil is that it does take quite a long time to dry. So really you're only going to get one coat on a day. Yeah, one of the things about applying the Danish oil, it's, it's a really forgiving finish. Um, it doesn't really matter if you, uh, you know, if you have runs down it and stuff like that, as long as you leave it to cure. And sometimes it can take a bit of time to cure. In fact, under some conditions I've known it to take a week or so. But if you do just leave it to cure, it'll, uh, you know, you can rub it down and it will come good. So you can see here that the rag's a bit dirty. Now the reason we're getting that is because the stain that I used, it's a kind of a turpentine, white spirit based um, stain. Really you're probably better using a water based stain because what will happen is the, uh, what this, the, you know, the, the Danish oil is actually lifting the stain off it, so it's dissolving it slightly. But um, it comes back to this is what I'm doing. You can do it any way you want to, of course. The only other problem with it is uh, if you were using like a spray lacquer, you could do this job in the morning, but because it's Danish oil, there's probably a, a week's worth of layering up. Probably I'll put four coats on it, something like that. So as you saw earlier, I went ahead and I fixed the output transformer to the back of the speaker in similar way to the original one. And I've also gone ahead and I've wired the secondary of our transformer to the voice coil of our speaker. And we've connected our output transformer and speaker to our impedance bridge. And it's nulling out at about 18 kilo ohm. I think we said we were gunning for about 17 and to get 18.8 well that's um, that's very close as I said these impedance measurements is somewhat of a movable feast um, if you actually measure these things with three different types of instruments you'll, you'll get three completely different numbers so you've just got to try to take your best guess but certainly that's going to be good enough for what we're doing well we've got everything wired up now and I think the only thing we're really waiting on is the battery before we can test this thing. So I think what we'd better do is we may as well fire up the Type 4 TARDIS and uh, pop back to 1940 and go and get one.
you know, one day I'm really going to have to sort out that bloody chameleon circuit. Anyway, I think we got away with it. Well, seeing as I was back in the 1940s, I thought I'd better do my bit for old queen and country. Christ on a bike, couldn't somebody put that bloody dog on a lead? So I borrowed a Spitfire and tootled off to Germany to smash the Hun. Not that they were very grateful, because apparently the war had finished two years earlier. And before coming home with a new battery, I just about had time to pop and see an old friend. Naughty girl. I'm just going to attach these wires temporarily because I think they'll be coming off again when I put this in its cabinet. We don't want to forget our fuse bulb. I am going to start commissioning the power supplies one at a time and we haven't got any valves installed yet so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be uh, just looking for the, um, the valve filament supply to each of the valve bases. So we should have two volts there, which we have, two volts there, which we have and if I can get in here, 2 volts here which we have, so we've got the heaters, they're good let's just check that the uh, on and off switch works which it does, that's good OK, so I'm going to go ahead and connect up the uh, grid bias voltages now I would say that these are probably the most important connections for the whole radio. So there's our minus 9. Minus 4.5. And our plus grid bias. OK, so we've got our grid bias coming into the radio and it actually comes in on the volume pot. He said, there it is, minus 9. And then it goes into the tuning cans via a resistor R1. So there's our minus 9 on one side. And here's the other side of R2. Sorry, R1. It's minus 7. Yep, good enough. So I've just gone ahead and plugged in our minus 4.5 volt grid bias supply and that's used actually to bias the output pentode which is V3, this valve here. So basically the, the actual previous detector stage couples into the grid of V3, the output valve, via this interstage transformer here. Um, quite an interesting little arrangement actually, a bit different to uh, the normal capacitive coupling which I've seen on pretty much a lot of the other radios I've played with. So we've got minus 4.5 volts coming in there, well minus 4.8 and what it should be doing is it should be going through the transformer and we should have, well the same here. And unfortunately we have absolutely nothing Let's just double check and go on to the grid of the valve because it does connect via a resistor which is R7. And again, nothing. So here's our minus 4.5 volt grid bias, which is, they call it GB1, so that comes in, goes into the bottom of the uh, transformer, and you can see it's actually wound as an auto transformer. Some audio gets coupled into it, and then the actual bias goes into the valve there via R R7. Um, so as you can see, with the, I've got all the valves removed at the moment, so there's no load on R7, so really if we've got 4.5 volts there, minus 4.5, we should have minus 4. 4.5 here unless somehow it was being pulled down. Well we've replaced those capacitors so it isn't being pulled down. So unfortunately I think we've got something wrong with our interstage coupling transformer which is uh, huh, annoying to say the least. 
So I've just put our meter on the ohm setting, so uh, let's just check the uh, connections there. Okay, we've got a beep, so the uh, the meter's working. Um, it's got a, a centre tap, which is actually towards, it's not really a centre, it's towards one end of the auto transformer. So we should have continuity to there, which we haven't. So we're probably not going to get continuity to the far end, which we haven't. And then I'm going to go from the uh, the far end to the middle section. So amazingly, our little audio level auto transformer here has some serious problems because it, it just happens to have every circuit, uh, every connection, open circuit. Now I've got to admit, I'm starting to get a little bit concerned here because the actual output transformer, the primary on that was open circuit. This is open circuit. And I'm actually a little bit concerned that some of the uh, the RF coils in here, we're going to find that they're going to be open circuit as well. I'm wondering if it's been stored wet or damp because, you know, the very, very fine windings are the first ones to go. So I think really before we do too much more work on this set, we still need to bring the voltage up. But if these uh, tuning cans are no good, if the tuning coils inside here are knackered, well, I'm pretty stuffed. I, I doubt I'll be able to repair that. Um, so I'm exploring options. I'm not sure what to do with this uh, interstage coupling transformer at the moment. It may be that we can try to replace it with a modern part, or maybe we can just disconnect it altogether and see if we can go for a standard kind of capacitor coupling method between the detector and the output pentode. So I'm guessing that this transformer is certainly going to be no use to us how it is, so I've got no choice but to go ahead, remove it, and uh, have a think about how we can repair it. Okay, let's see if we can wrestle this thing out. Oh, didn't put up too much of a fight. Just looking at the transformer, it does look as though it's kind of uh, crimped together. The laminations are, it's got a metal frame which is folded over the laminations to clamp it together. So I'm not exactly sure how you, uh, you get this apart. I'm assuming I've got to bend these back. Now I would definitely be the first one not to advocate using screwdrivers as pry bars, but sometimes you really don't have a lot of choice. Oof, that is tight. <sighs> okay, so it's uh, still got some wires soldered onto it here. So I'm going to try and uh, see if we can get them out. So it's kind of a wound bob in this thing and uh, hopefully we can go ahead and we can now split the e-cores apart. I have actually slightly bent these a little bit so I'll have to give these a tap them back together. Uh, it's not an exact science, I think they'll go back together okay. You know, it's funny, I really can't see any heavy corrosion or bad damage on here. I'm wondering, uh, well, there's no reason why it would start working again, but I think I'll just do another continuity check on it. Yeah, it's definitely open circuit, that. Well, you know what, I've got a feeling that our interstage coupling transformer could be slightly out of tolerance, so uh, I think we're just going to put that on one side and think of a cunning plan to fix it. Well, you know what, I'd be the first one to admit that I'm no expert on these uh, interstage transformers, but it's one of them things that needs must. When, you, uh, when you've got a problem, you have to go and uh, learn something new, don't you? So I've been on some of the uh, vintage radio restoration websites getting some advice and also doing some of my own reading about interstage transformers. So it would appear that our interstage transformer does a couple of jobs. 
it uh, it one it does couple the uh, the minus grid bias voltage to the output valve but the other thing it does it actually does some voltage magnification because apparently these old valves didn't have an awful lot of gain these uh, interstage transformers the way that they tend to be wired uh, this one was wired as an auto transformer but it, it gives a step up in voltage of anything from three to five we should be able to actually convert our set to being effectively just capacitively coupled from the previous stage so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm just actually just going to connect in a grid leak resistor and I think the value of this is about 800k and the reason I'm going to use an 800k resistor is because I found this at the back of my bench and I didn't have to get out of the chair to select something else so I'm, I'm just going to solder this on here to provide a little bit of negative bias and I'm actually going to leave the uh, I'm going to leave the detected audio from the previous stage I'm going to leave that disconnected at the moment because what I think I'll do is I just want to make sure that we can uh, we can power the setup, see if the speaker works, see if the output valve works, and uh, if it does, I really want to get on to checking these tuning coils because I've just got a terrible feeling that if the fine thin wiring in the interstage transformer and the output audio transformer they were both open circuit so I'm just concerned that whatever caused that to happen may have actually affected these coils as well because if they're damaged there's no no getting back from that I'm pretty sure I won't be able to repair that so that will scrap the set so we have to get to a stage where we can uh, we can get some radio signals into the radio have a sniff round and uh, maybe see if we've got some audio output as well so let's uh, let me just go ahead and solder this resistor in temporarily well just to let you know where we are i've gone ahead and i've connected our 120 volts and i've got a bit of a problem when i actually turn the set on he said reaching over precariously we're actually drawing now we're drawing about 12 milliamps i'm going to turn the set off but we have actually got our uh, voltage up, our, our B+. Plus. We've got that as 133 volts. But I'm kind of concerned that we're actually drawing um, 12 milliamps, 12 or 13 milliamps. And the reason I'm concerned is because we've got no valves in. Um, we shouldn't be drawing anything. Okay, so we've got a 120 volt line coming in. And the 120 volt line, it feeds various points of our circuits via resistors. And those circuits, uh, starting from this side, are R8, R10 and R11 and it also feeds the um, the plate of our output pento valve here via I think that's R12 um, but we really shouldn't be drawing a lot of current at the moment because I said the valves are removed so what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to look at the voltage dropped across uh, each of these resistors in turn because that's going to give me an idea where the actual uh, where the where that current is going to in theory we shouldn't really see any voltage across these resistors at the moment because they've got no load on them um, so basically if we see a voltage across any of these that's going to show us where the current's going so i've gone ahead i've connected the meter across r8 which is 10k so what i'm going to do i'm just going to reach over i'm going to switch on the radio and wham bam we've got 113 sorry 133 volts being dropped across our 10k and if you uh, if you do the math on that that's 13 milliamps and our meter here our AVO is showing that we're pulling 12 so unfortunately we've got a problem now I was dreading this this resistor R8 feeds these uh, these tuning coils here and I'm desperately worried that what what the problem will be is one of these um, one of these coils is probably shorting to the chassis of the radio it's shorting out to ground somewhere um, and the reason I'm really worried about that is because all the fine wires on the other inductors they've all seem to have been open circuit or been manky so I've just gone ahead and I've disconnected R8 which is the 10k resistor which is feeding one of these uh, tuning cans and uh, now we've got 130 volt, 134 volts of our B+, but more importantly we're now only drawing less than a milliamp of uh, B plus current. So well, unfortunately we've got something going on inside that tuning can which I was absolutely dreading. We're going to have to investigate that a little bit further. Well I've got to admit I can't really explain it, but when you've worked on radios long enough you get kind of a sixth sense of... Uh, 
I don't know. Let's just call it a six sense. Now I know that this tuning condenser here is in kind of circuit with this tuning coil. So before I open this, I just wondered could I have a shorted plate, something that's shorting out to ground. So I actually went ahead and uh, I disconnected the uh, the variable capacitor, and uh, I've got one side of the variable capacitor here uh, on this jumper clip, and then the wire that was feeding the, uh, the into the tuning can here. I'm going to just touch it. And you can see that it draws current. So let me just disconnect the power and make this clip permanent. These crocodile clips I'm using, they're, they're cheap and they're horrid. They're really stiff to squeeze apart. And then when you have squeezed them apart, they, uh, they don't grip. Right, put the power on. So it's drawing, uh, well it's drawing our 12 milliamps, but what I'm going to do is uh, I've just tuned, can you see as I turn this it's either drawing current or not. So what's happening is the um, the plate is obviously bent or corroded and uh, it's shorting out the uh, the high voltage. So I've got to find out what's, uh, <laughs> I've got to find out what's causing that. Looking at these plates they've got quite a lot of heavy corrosion on them and uh, it could be that that's just enough to uh, cause a short circuit. So that's what that problem is. Uh, I think we got a bit lucky there finding that. That could have been uh, an awkward one to find but as I say hopefully we've uh, we've just uh, missed a bullet. So I think I can demonstrate that a bit more graphically. So I've got our own meter here. One side of the own meter is on the radio chassis and the, the other part is to the moving part of our variable capacitor here. So you can see if I, well I'm going to open the capacitor up fully now and we've got a reading of uh, infinity. Uh, but if I actually close it up it reaches, well it drops down to 0.5 ohms. So that's shorting out our, um, our B plus voltage. So to be honest what I'm trying to do is I'm just trying to isolate the plate that's causing the problem. I actually think it might be this end plate here because I can physically see that it it does look very close and uh, generally the process is just to try and go through them, give each of the plates a little bit of a wobble and uh, hopefully you can find the one that's at fault. There is actually quite a few of them here which uh, do look as though they're pretty much touching so it could be any of them. In fact, I think it could be uh, kind of multiple plates we're having problems with here. It looks as though we've just got one spot now. And it's this plate that's giving us a jip. Okay, so I've just managed to adjust our rotor plates here and uh, I've just given them a, a little bit of a bend. It was a fifth one in that was causing all the problems. Um, at some point what I would probably do if I was really doing a good restoration on this, I would take the whole tuning uh, assembly off, disassemble it, drop it in the ultrasonic cleaner, that would get, get rid of all this, uh, what do you call it verdigris, all this uh, kind of aluminium oxide and deposit on it because that's certainly not helping and uh, it would be much better if we could clean all that up. So, uh, But that's a job for another day. At least we've got uh, we've got some tuning now and we're not shorting out the HT. So that's good isn't it? Okay so uh, we've got our unit switched on and we're not drawing any current at the moment which is exactly what I would expect. So I've just gone ahead and I've replaced our valves, I've uh, fixed the uh, top cap connections back on. I think we've sorted out the tuning condenser. The interstage transformer was completely knackered so, uh, well, it needs rewinding. So I've put that onto one side and um, I've converted the radio to being, uh, just to being normal, uh, capacitively coupled between the detector stage and the final output pentode and uh, installed a grid leak resistor. So hopefully if this radio is going to tune, it's going to tune. So uh, let's put some power on and try it. Served before 10.30am, except in selected restaurants which will serve this until 11 <laughs> That was a bit of a flute, wasn't it? If not, you've got a friend in me. Is it, is it tuning though? Well, it seems to that I've still got a bit of a dodgy capacitor there, haven't I? Oh, we've got one station. Is that another one? Bye-bye. He is a better social life than me and all of my friends put together, honestly. He a 
professional. I mean, I enjoy it. Okay, so our reaction control works. That's just applying some positive feedback or regeneration, as they used to call back in the day. I've got to admit, I've never found these uh, regen reaction controls. Um, very useful. I've never really got the hang of them. It's meant to make the radio a bit more selective. Oh, it looks like we might have a short circuit on there as well. It's meant to make the radio a little bit more selective and sensitive, but in practice, all the I've, all I've ever found they do is they put the uh, they make the set into a transmitter. It just goes into resonance. So I've never really got the hang of these reaction controls. But just looking at this one, when I'm adjusting it, the um, the current is going up massively on the set. I'm just looking at the uh, current meter here. I don't know if that's in shot. Let's see if I can bring it over. Can you see that now? Can you see the needle? You might be able to. Can you see that when I adjust the reaction, the uh, the current shooting right up? That could be because it's going into oscillation, but it could also just be that we've got another um, crappy control here. Not sure. Million customers. Just search Vitality Life. Vitality. Positively different. So we've got one station there. There's another one. Uh, still haven't got this tuning capacitor perfect by any means, I don't think. I've got to admit, to me, the audio quality sounds as good as any other kind of AM radio I've got, and uh, I'm kind of wondering if we actually need to bother to rewind this interstage coupling transformer because you know, he'd, he'd look at the, the young players that are coming through the job. Th this set has got an awful lot of volume. Perhaps we'll see a lot more of them this year. Certainly got more volume than I would listen to a radio at in my, radio at in my home. Okay, so I've turned the set onto long wave now, and this is long wave radio four. So it certainly doesn't appear to be as sensitive on long wave, but that could be for a variety of reasons, including the aerial setup that I'm using. Vigorous in our negotiations with the EU, you know, stepping it up. That is a way to do that. To find a parking space as close as possible to anxiety, and if we're going to. Well, I'm sure you'll agree. I think we've had a bit of a breakthrough together with this radio this afternoon. It certainly looks as though it should be uh, functional and we can get it up and running as it was intended. So I think for today, I'm probably going to say, well, that will do. But join me in the final part where we're going to have a look at seeing if we can rewind this into stage transformer. So that should be quite interesting. And we're also going to finish off the work on the cabinet and reinstall the radio back into its chassis. And hopefully we should be able to call it done then. But as I said, until next time, I think that'll do. As always, thanks very much for joining me and I hope to see you again very soon. But bye bye for now. Bye bye.